Hello everyone. Um, thanks for joining the session. Um, so this is the second. Um, can you just um, put your speakers off? Thanks. This is the second session for the um, introduction to project management ses session, how to eat an elephant. Um, and I'll just hand over to um, Ben um, to take us through the session. Thank you, Ben, for being um, yeah, willing to host the second session on um, project management. Um, so today is going to be a bit different as we have some people in the room. Um, we are our team, which is um, half the people um, that the project management um, session is for, is all sitting together in a room. Um, so we're going to do it a bit differently in terms of having a face-to-face -face and an online session. But um, we will have all the activities and so forth online. Um, thank you all for joining. And I'll hand over to Ben. Good morning, everybody. It's good to actually see people. Last week when we presented, I presented completely blind. I don't know what you like, look like. I couldn't see your comments. So hopefully it's a little bit more interactive. Uh, what we are going to do today is we're going to continue with the last session. So just a, a brief uh, recap. In case anybody new is in the room, just in terms of the general protocol in the event that somebody asks a very intelligent question, then Johannes is going to stop me because I, I can't see all of the comments as they're happening. Okay, so we did an introduction for those who might have forgotten I have done some projects. What we are going to do in this session, this session is a supplement to a LinkedIn course. You can do the course for free. And once we have gone through these sessions and we've completed it, I'll give you the LinkedIn link. You can go and do it in your own time. If you work very fast, you'll be able to complete it in less than two hours. And then you get a little badge on your profile and everybody can see that you are quite clever. Now, I need to mention at this point, if, is there anybody in the room who has watched or online who has watched Grey's Anatomy? Can you stick up your hand or just say me, I've watched Grey's Anatomy if you've watched Grey's Anatomy. Now, after having watched Grey's Anatomy, would you say you are a medical doctor? No, you're not. So just like participating in this course, you are not immediately a project manager. This is the introduction. This is to start explaining stuff to you so that you can understand how it works. Once you have been in enough projects and you have done enough of these courses, then you can start calling yourself a project manager. Okay, so I am going to jump. We had a group challenge and we did something very simple like making coffee. Now it's a little bit more difficult if you have to do it virtually. What the intention with a project was is to get you to take a very simple task and break it down into steps. Put each step on a post-it, put it in a board, and put it in sequence. It's uh, relatively easy. And then we gave a class a group challenge. Now, different groups got different challenges. What you did not know is that all of the challenges eventually make up one big challenge, or they all part, different parts of the same problem. And just as expected, it didn't go too brilliant. The reason for this was that I intentionally gave you very vague instructions. This made it very difficult for you, even if you did exactly the right thing to achieve a goal, simply because the guidelines and the framework around it was big enough that the elephant can fall through the cracks. So, Intentionally, everybody 
were misled and you misunderstood what you had to do. When we discussed what is a project, there's various definitions for a project. We differentiated between what is a project and what is business as usual. So if you design a new rocket ship, that is a project. If a rocket ship goes up and the rocket ship has 10 liftoffs, that is business as usual. We looked at the characteristics of a project and we specifically looked at the project constraints. And why are these project constraints? Because it's very difficult to deliver a project that's on budget, on scope, and on time, and perfect quality. It's usually easier for you to get two of them. So you can get high quality and speed if you pay a lot. You can get it quick and dirty, but not very good, or cheap and good, but it's going to take very long. So when we discussed how quality impacts on projects, and I've given you a couple of everyday problems, and then we had to end, unfortunately, just as things got interesting and we got into real projects. So we discussed the Montreal Olympics of 1976. Now you may have a question, 1976 is like a previous generation, why bother? Because you can learn from mistakes that other people made. The examples that I'm giving you are specifically selected to illustrate some of the aspects and some of the challenges that you have on a project. So if I give you a practical example, it makes it easier to understand. Okay, now Montreal Olympics took them 30 years to pay it off because they made quite a mess of it of our administration. The party in front of the camera was beautiful and nobody knew what the chaos was behind the scenes. Now, if we look at another example, you buy a way of uh, raising your hands who think NASA is a pretty clued up organization. Okay, in the room, most people seem to think that NASA is a pretty clued up organization. This is the Mars Orbiter. This was a project that NASA launched in 1995 that they wanted to send up a satellite. And it was supposed to go to Mars. Uh, to Mars. And this Orbiter is part of, is part of a, a, a set of two. So if this is Mars for, I'm holding up a cupcake for the people who are not here. This is Mars, there's a little car or a vehicle or a, a piece of equipment that will actually land on the planet. And this Mars orbiter is a satellite that sits outside the planet. This thing on the planet measures the temperature, the wind speed, the whatever. I'm going to try and keep it simple. Sorry for the people online. I'm giving a practical explanation. So there's two items. One is a vehicle that lands on the planet. The second is a satellite. The vehicle that lands on the planet measures certain climatological information on Mars, and it sends it up to the satellite. And this satellite beams it back I want to say to South Africa, it wants to beam it back to Earth, where the scientists are sitting. Now, due to the design of the specific satellite, you can see it's a little bit lopsided. It's got a, it's got a solar, it's got a solar panel on the one side, and then a whole bunch of components. Now, so this can cause while this thing is moving, it can cause movement. So what they can do from Earth is they, just like on television, there's thrusters. And they can switch on the thrusters uh, remotely. 
and this is a nine, uh, this is a twenty-year-old video of what it looked like. So it will it will blow air and it will push it, and this thing can stay stable more or less. Now a part of this project was outsourced to a different company. This satellite, as well as the vehicle that went with it, took nine months to get to Mars. When it got close to Mars, they started planning to get it at the right height above the planet. So they were planning to have it at approximately 226 kilometers above the surface. What they did not know is that half of the project team worked on the imperial system and half of the project team worked on the metric system. So the one half worked in centimeters and the other half worked in inches. And nobody knew this and they didn't test this beforehand. So what, what the effect of that was, was that uh, the one computer sends information which it thinks is in pound per second, and the second computer receives the information which it assumes is in newton per second. So one poor, this is what it means is one pound of force is equal to four and a half newtons. So if you give the instruction on this side, you are four and a half times wrong on that side, either too much or too little, depending on what you wanted to do. So they were trying to move the satellite to get it exactly at the, the right height, assuming based on the information that they have, that this satellite is sitting at 226 kilometers above Mars. However, it was closer to 57 kilometers above Mars, and when the satellite went behind the horizon, they never saw it again. They assume that the satellite burned up in the atmosphere because it was too close to Mars's atmosphere. The net effect or the cost of this mistake, apart from the fact that you now have a piece of equipment sitting on Mars that you can't use, was that they blew 193 million US dollars and they've got nothing to show for it. Next example, again we are going to look at NASA because you think they're a brilliant Europe organization. I'm not saying that they're not, I just think they are a very good example. This is a weather satellite, it's part of the NOAA range. Um, and if you go and look at NASA, they've got a Forest of Africa and a very funny acronym that they use for this program. Now, this is a weather satellite that was supposed to be used on the Earth, and it will circle the planet and every 20 and once every 24 hours, and it sends back weather information as it goes. Now, as you can see, this is a fairly chunky piece of our item, and because it is for use in space, there's equipment on all sides, at the top, on the sides, at the bottom. So what they do in the workshop is there's a specific base plate that this thing is affixed to, and they keep it like that so they can lift it and turn it, and if somebody needs to work at the top, you can bring it down and they can work and they can take it back or this side or this side, they can turn it whichever way they want. Now there's various teams who work on various components. So one team wanted to work on something and they worked on it and for whatever reason, this was while this piece of equipment was lying horizontal, or I mean it, it was standing up. And for whatever reason, they decided that they are going to take out the bolts and the nuts that keeps this thing up. Now, in terms of protocol, you are supposed to write everything that you do in a book to record, we have done with this, we have done this, we've run these tests. The team that did it forgot to write the stuff in the book. 
So when web time is finished, they disappear when the next team comes in. They want to work on their piece of equipment, which is somewhere else, and they decide that they have to tilt it so that they can get on the other side. They tilt a bit, and the satellite fell over because it wasn't fixed. There is a, actually on a record what one person in that team looked at it. He said something to the effect of, hey, guys, the bolts are gone. And nobody clicked, and they continued doing what they were wanted to do and the thing fell over. What the net effect of this was, was that they had to replace 70%, 75% of the equipment on the satellite. The repairs to the satellite cost 135 million US. The total cost at the end of the day for this project shot up to 564 million US. It is because of a tiny little mistake that somebody did not follow protocol and the other people saw that there, were, there was a problem, but nobody clicked and they said, whoa, stop the bus. Let's fix this before we continue. They just went. Okay, next one. Who's been to London? By show of hands, has anybody here been? Okay, I've been. Johannes has been, I'm guessing some people online have been. Heathrow is the, the OR Tambo of London. It's the biggest airport. And it is an extremely busy airport. Now for years and years, this airport had four terminals. So a terminal is where you climb on and off and you check in your ticket and they take your baggage. And it got extremely busy. So Heathrow is the largest airport in the UK. And well, I can't vouch for currently, but at this, uh, at this point in time, it was the second busiest airport in the world. So by 2008, Heathrow had half a million planes per year. That's 500,000 airplanes landing and taking off. And 65 million passengers. They decided that they needed to expand. So they decided they are going to build a new terminal. This terminal cost 4.3 billion in pounds. It took the, the planning for this terminal took 19 years and the construction took six years. And everything came along nicely. The building was built, etc. And it's a, it was a fairly big project. There were 180 companies just working on information technology. And they had 163 different computer systems uh, running in this part of the airport. This required 400,000 man hours of programming. There were 546 interfaces, 9,000 connected devices for the techies who are talking about Wi-Fi, 9,000 connected devices. This, there were 2,100 computers, 175 lifts, 131 escalators, and 18 kilometers of conveyor belts to take the baggage to the airplane. That's a, that's a fairly big construction. The capacity was calculated that this should be able to handle 12,000 pieces of luggage per hour, every hour, 24-7. So they bought everything. They got the queen to come and have our opening party two weeks before the planned opening day. And in their wisdom, they decided on day one, the day that we are open. We are going to cut out over 70% of the traffic from the harvest we are bringing to this one. So it hasn't worked for one day, and now you are transferring 70% of all of our traffic to this specific building. 
before the time, they had 15,000 volunteers that they used to test and they made the people stand in queues and go to the toilet and whatnot to see that everything is working. And I thought that's hunky dory. And the day that they opened, now you can ask yourself what possibly could go wrong. On the day that they opened, construction was not finished. People who worked there and passengers could not get into the parking. The people who worked on baggage could not log into the system. They couldn't swipe their cards so that the computer recognized that they were working. So they couldn't do anything. Uh, people waited two and a half hours for their luggage. There was an error in the luggage system. So when they put the stuff on a tractor and they take it to the airplane, halfway there, the computer says, oh, sorry, that plane already took off. So the driver says, ish, and he turns around and he goes back. However, the plane did not take off. I was sitting and waiting for the luggage. Eventually, they had to take off. The long and the short of this. Uh, that 34 planes were cancelled. A large number of planes took off without their luggage. And they couldn't fix this. Over the next 10 days, some 42,000 pieces of luggage failed to travel with the owners on the same plane. And 500 flights were cancelled. Now, for yourself, you can take a calculator and calculate what the impact is. What is the ticket to fly to London? There are 300, 400 people on an airplane times 500 flights. It will give you an idea of the impact. Now, people are missing their connecting flights. They are late for meetings. They go to another part of the world. They don't have any clothes. They have nothing. You can imagine how angry people were. And everything was going fine up to the point that they went live. Now, I've got a, uh, just an interesting little elephant stat for you. The amount of steel used in the roof for this building is 17,000 ton. That is equal to 2,833 2, elephant bulls. You would have noticed the theme of, of this training is elephants. So where I find the ele interesting elephants, that's I'll throw it out at you. Okay, next one. It's another Olympic Games. This is the Winter Olympics that took place in Russia. Uh, Russia won the competition and they for Winter Olympics, which is a lot of snow sports. So it's skiing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They decided to use a town that was next to the coast. And because this is next to the coast, it's not cold enough and there's not enough snow, so they can't have skiing competitions there. But there was another town 70 kilometers away that was high up in the mountains. So they decided, okay, cool. The main town is the, the activities in the main town, which is Sochi. And the second town, is Krasnaya Poljana, which is a mountain ski resort. They'll have all, all of those kind of activities there, and the people have to travel between the two. However, there wasn't a decent road, and they didn't have a capacity to transport the necessary number of people between the two. So they decided, okay, let's just quickly put in a new road and a new railway. This town that they selected did not have enough of a required type of facility, so they had to build a lot. They didn't have enough accommodation, so they had to build brand new hotels. And they had the security risk. It was security worries, so they had to have a lot of security. This project was initially budgeted at 12 billion. Then the result 
depending on who you believe, was that this project cost more than 70 billion US. This Olympic Games is more expensive than any 10 Olympic Games before it put together. And by the time it started, they were not uh, ready. So a lot of the finishes were not done. I don't see what the problem is. I think this is a brilliant way to meet new people. And a lot of uh, a lot of the infrastructure wasn't finished. Okay, another example. Let's come to South Africa. Who has heard of Modernfontein's new city? This was uh, Modernfontein is next to Eden Well. It's that piece of land that's uh, on the other side of Lindbrow Park. A Chinese company called Zendai Group approached the city of Johannesburg and they came up with this brilliant idea that they want to jointly develop the Manhattan of Africa. So it's a very smart setup that they wanted to build with flats and houses and offices and what have you. The initial plan was to invest 84 billion in this South African land. It's a 1,600 hectare site. They planned for 50,000 new homes. And it was anticipated to create 300,000 new jobs. What happened? Nothing. Why did nothing happen? Because the parties couldn't agree on the goals of the project. So it's a massive opportunity to create something fantastic and they couldn't even get over ground. They couldn't even start because before they even started, it collapsed because they couldn't agree on what they wanted to achieve. Next example, this would have affected your life by now if you are South African. The one, Medupi, they came up with the idea in 2007 and they wanted to build one of these is Medupi and the other one is Kusile, but judging by the pictures, I'm sorry, I can't tell you which is which. One of them was initially planned with three of these units and the budget was supposed to be 32 billion. And a few months down the line, they said, now let's just quickly make a double. So they doubled the size of one project and at the very same time they decided it's a good idea to also do a completely different one that's just as big. The initial budget for Madupi, 79 billion. Initial budget for Kusile, 69 billion. Madupi when completed, as opposed to at that stage, things might have changed between now and then. At that stage, Madupi would have been the fourth largest coal station of its type in the world. Kusile, with a specific technology that it's using, was supposed to be the biggest of its type in the world. So what happened? Well, lots of things happened. You all read newspapers. One of the problems that appears to have happened is that the technology that they planned on using, they got in people from overseas who do not have experience working with South African coal. South African coal have very, has very specific characteristics when it burns, and it's not the same as coal from India or coal from China, so you can't use exactly the, the same approach. So the dimensions of the things that they planned weren't exactly right, and there were quality problems. You would have heard of the, the boilers that were installed. They had to redo the stuff because the quality was not on standard. So the combined initial cost was around 150 billion, give or take. These things were supposed to have been finished in 2011 ballpark for both. 
It is 2021 now. Uh, uh, I think it's Medupi is, is, let's say, 100% or close to 100% operational now. Kusile is still 50% operational. The estimated cost to completion is 460 billion from a budget of 150 billion. Next one, you may or may not have heard of us. SAS all decided to open a new factory in the USA for whatever the logic was. So in 2010, they announced that they are going to do it. They put together a team and they worked on a feasibility study. So that is a team that looks into what does it take, what's required and how much is it going to cost. And in November 2011, they began working on this. Two things went wrong. The one thing was they decided, let's quickly add this. And we, we have one factory, but we're going to make a bigger factory and we're making new things there as well. And they keep on adding bits. The second thing that happened is when the project started rolling, happening, people were too scared to talk when they picked up a problem. So the project is, for example, you dig a hole, maybe the ground is softer than you think it is, and that is the issue. So now you have to take additional steps, but now everybody's too scared to talk about it because they don't want to get in trouble. This means the problem gets bigger. This was supposed to cost somewhere in the region of 8.9 billion when completed. Uh, they did a 2016 worst case prediction. So I look at everything and say, if everything goes wrong, we think it's going to cost 11 billion in 2016. At 2020, the revised costs is standing at 13 billion. So it is 2 billion more than what the worst cost was. And SAS all got in such deep financial problem because of problems, because of this specific project that they had to sell 50% to a joint venture. Now, it's like SAS is not a Mickey Mouse company. So the reason I am showing you these things is to show to you how things in practical everyday life can go wrong. You intend you are going to do this, you plan you are going to start here yeah, and you are going to end here. Yeah. And if you didn't plan for everything that is supposed to happen and that could go wrong, you are never going to get here. Okay, now if we look at some scary project stats. The percentage some of these examples are information technology. Now, I know I've shown you a lot of construction examples because you can physically see with a construction project, you can look at the picture and you can see what's wrong. With a information technology project, it's not so easy to see what the problem is. The percentage of information technology projects that go so bad that they threaten the existence of a company. So the sources where this information comes from as a research from McKinsey or research from Harvard Business Review. I've each time put the source in brackets. So the percentage of projects that can go so bad that it can actually sink the business, 17%. Now think how much must go wrong so that a computer project can actually sink the business. The number uh, based on the research by Harvard Business Review, one out of six projects had a cost of over around of 200%. McKinsey, the average cost of over around for non-software projects, 43%. Software projects can run over without trying to add 66%. Now, ABM is another company that's not a Mickey Mouse company. The percentage of projects that meet on time, on quality, on budget, 
40 percent. So 60 percent by mass y novel x. Out of 10,640 projects, the number of companies who have completed 100 percent of projects successful is only two and a half percent. Failures, a project can collapse. And if you go and look at what happened, 57% of collapses is due to a breakdown in communication. People don't talk to one another. This side doesn't know what this side is thinking. This side sees a problem and they don't tell this side. The information is not flowing to the people who have to do something with it. Projects that fail because senior management don't get involved, 75%. So if I'm talking of a project, yeah, I'm not saying like when Johannes asks you to work on a slide, that doesn't need the dean of a faculty or the rector or the chancellor's involvement. If it's a big project and it's with the Department of Health and there's lots of stakeholders, then you need to get senior people involved. Projects completed on time versus the Project Management Institute of the US. Only 55% of projects are finished on time. 62% are completed on budget. And generously across all kinds of projects in their research, 73% of projects were completed and met their actual goals that you set out. Now you can ask yourself, and we're gonna go to the next session, why do these things happen? And this is why I started by explaining to you what is budget, what is scope, what is time, and this is how it can affect projects. Now I've given you a whole bunch of examples of things that can go wrong. Now, if we keep in mind some of the projects of the past, how long do you think it should take to build a 50-story building that's a mix of flats and offices? So, Johannes is going to put a short poll. Um, for those that didn't do it last week, just um, go to Mentimeter. So at the top, www.menti.com, and then use the code um, to just add in your answer. Okay, Johannes will copy the code in the chat section. Is it on screen? I'm sharing my screen. You should see it. I don't. Okay, cool. Okay, so it's a simple question. How long do you think it should take to build a 50-story building? Okay, we've got one person who thinks I 18 months. For all three things, of all my kind of work, I'm looking for three things to work with. Just a uh, question to the audience. Can you hear me? Because I'm getting a little, of a, a little bit of a circular movement of sound here. Okay, two people think it can take 18 months. Okay, we've got one or optimist in the class that thinks it's less than three months. Three 
information. Okay, I'm going to close this. This was just to get your information. So if I show you an example, if you get project you management right. Share your screen again. Sorry. Not saying Is it you it? And now. I'm just trying to get back to my presentation. OK, if you get project management right, it is amazing what you can actually do. This is an example of a construction of a building. If you look at it's a very short video, it's approximately one minute, 30 seconds. If you look on the left hand screen of your corner, corner of your screen, there's going to be a timer here. This is a time lapse of construction of a building, 50 stories. If you haven't tested the timer is now is Okay, they cheated a little bit. What they did is they stopped the counter once the building got to roof level. They were technically still building. They still had to put in windows and lights and stuff, but the construction was finished. If you take a guess how long this took, I can tell you it took a sum total to build the construction. The frame of the building it took them 19 days. This shows you what's possible when you can get your project management down to a T and you know what you're doing. So this, in this whole group, there's only one person who believes in the power of project management, but gets less than three months. So how to do a project? So what frequently happens, is you get called in, you are told that there's going to be a project, there's a project meeting starts on Monday, you have to be there 10 o'clock in this meeting room. You don't know what to expect. You are filled with open optimism and you are so excited because you want to get involved. Now the meeting starts, people will say stuff, 
you don't fully understand what's going on at the end of a meeting, the chair of a meeting will say, okay, so it's agreed that you're going to take one month to deliver 10 pink elephants and you've got no budget. Thank you. See you at the end of month. And everybody walks out and you're confused and you don't understand. And that is how a lot of projects start. Firstly, what you need to spend time on is to understand the problem. Now, I'm going to tell you a 700 year old story. So I know it's 700 years old because the guy who wrote the story down is more than 700 years. So the story has to be at least 700. And it's an elephant story to fit with the theme. There was a specific village and there were a couple of blind people living in the village. And one day a elephant was brought to the village. And these blind guys were born blind. They have never seen an elephant. They don't understand the concept of what is an elephant. So they heard this elephant and they said they want to go and look at the elephant. And the villagers took them along and they parked them all around the elephant. So each guy is standing on a different side of the elephant. And the first guy is looking at the trunk and he says, this has to be a snake because it's just like a... And the second guy is holding the ear and it feels like a carpet. So he says, this has to be a carpet. The next one is feeling the teeth the tusks and do you mean thinks it's a spear because he looks at his part. The next, next guy has his legs or has his hand around the leg. So it feels like this and it's a rough and it's straight up. So it feels like a tree. So in his, this is what he thinks it is. The next guy feels the skin and it is very rough and he thinks it must be a wall. The last guy is on the tail end. He's flapping the tail and he thinks it must be a rope. And nobody can agree on what this is. So they called the wisest guy in the village. And he came down and he said to them, you are all correct, but you are all equally wrong. So why are you correct? Because everybody looks at their part of a problem. They have no idea of the rest of the problem. They're only looking at their section. So you might be correct in terms of your little section, but you are completely uh, wrong in terms of the rest of the animal. So in that first meeting, you need to understand what is going on. And if you don't understand, you must ask questions. It is possible and it is very likely that if I walk in and I say you have a new project and you have to build a pink elephant or a new building or a rocket ship, but you do not have all of the information that you have to plan a project at that point in time. You don't know what's required. You maybe don't understand the, the problem. You don't know what money you have. You don't know what the resources you have. So you have to go and plan these things. So what I suggest is I have a first meeting to discuss the problem and start uh, wrapping your head around it. And when you go away, you plan, you come back and say, I can do this in two weeks at the required quality. And it, most of the time it's not going to happen. Somebody's going to tell you, you have three hours of, you've got 30 hours or three months to do X amount of work. Now, what is very important to agree in a project is who's the role players? Is this an internal project? So if somebody in the department asks you to build a slide, one slide, you have to put a picture on a slide. It is a relatively simple. If you are asked 
to be involved on a new computer system, it is much more complicated. There's potentially other people who have to be, be involved. So you need to understand who is who and with who and who are asked to participate. Next thing, for every project, you need the rules and governance, who reports to who, what is the process, etc. You need to understand if there's a overlap or if there's dependencies. Now, these are concepts that I'm going to jump in in a little while. If, if you have to get involved in an IT project and there is an IT department in wherever you work, there's an overlap because this is their responsibility and you have to get involved. Similar, if it's with finance and, and HR or whatever, there's always, there's potentially an overlap with our department. And you need to understand that because our other people are going to get angry when they see you poking your nose in their business and they don't understand why you are there and vice versa. You get frustrated because you cannot do your job and those people don't know that you are supposed to work on this thing. Next thing, a dependency. Sometimes one thing has to be finished before you can start with the next thing. You have to make coffee before you can drink it. And in the sequence of things that happens in a project, you need to understand what that sequence is. The next thing, we've discussed this, you understand what the scope is, is exactly what you have to do. You have to understand if you have budget. Now, yes, you might have projects where there's not specifically a budget, but in the bigger scheme of things, trust me, there is a budget. If you run out and you spend two million rands, it's going to be trouble. Next thing, you have to understand what the timelines are. So some things have to be done by certain times. Next thing, you have to understand to use the resources in the project. Is it only me who has to do this? Or do I work with him and him? And what are the different roles? Next, what's the process for what's involved? What's the roadmap to get us to the end? And lastly, what kind of elephant do we have to build? You have to understand and be exactly on the map. And everybody has to be on the same page in terms of deliverables. Now, if we look at this perspective, this is a picture, as you can see. Now, for I, I want you to take 10 seconds and look at this picture. I'm going to ask you a very simple question. It's not a trick question. So take your one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. For who of you is this picture completely static? It's not. Not moving. Please stick right. up your hand or say me. It's static in the comment section. If if it's static for for anybody, is it static for anybody? No. Okay. There are some people who think it is static. Next question: Who thinks it is moving very slowly? There's a large number of hands coming up saying it's moving. For who of you think it's not moving slowly, it is, it's, as you'll say, it's faster than slow. There could be somebody, if you think that this thing is actually spreading or it's moving fast, then there's nothing wrong with that answer. But the point I want to make about perspective is what if I told you this is not a gif? This is not an animated picture. It is a static picture. What happens when your brain looks at this and you interpret this picture, if you are stressed, and I'm not talking nonsense here, you can go and double check me. If you are stressed, your brain will tell you that this thing is moving quickly. If you are not so stressed, it will be moving at 
it's a medium speed. If you are relatively calm, it will move just a little bit. And if you are completely chilled and nothing in the world bothers you, then you can see that this is a static picture. So why do I show you this? There are uh, 10 plus people looking at the same picture and there are different opinions on the exact same thing. So you have to understand in a project, people look at things from their perspective. I look at what I see and it's not necessarily what you can see. And that leads to miscommunication, misunderstanding, and you're not going to come in that they ain't go because you are not on the same page. You see things differently. If finance talks about something, they will talk about it from a finance perspective. If HR looks at it, they'll talk from their perspective. If whichever medical specialist looks at something, they talk at it from their perspective and they might not be considering other people's perspective. Another one, you look at the situation. This is the exact same situation from two sides. The one side will think that the lion is eating a baby. The other side can see that she's just picking him up and carrying it. It's the exact same picture and you will have different opinions about what's going on because people have different perceptions and interpretations. Now, life is all about perspective. For some people, the thinking of a Titanic was a tragedy, but for all the lobsters in the kitchen, it was a miracle. So you need to think at the situation from somebody else's viewpoint. If you think something, but if you happen to agree with a statement that I make or you think it's funny, you are allowed to have a little giggle or something so that we can have some uh, reaction. Now to understand the problem, there are various ways and means that you can unpack a problem. The first one is very easy. It's what? when, why, who, how. And you are asked those questions until everybody has the same understanding of what the situation is. You can also ask why, why, why or what, 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 until you get or why, 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 so we want to do a computer project. Why do we want to do it? The training is ineffective and we want to implement a system that allows us to do more effective training. How do we going to, how are we going to do it? And you keep on drilling down and drilling down and drilling down until you get to the solution. Next one. This is what we've done already. You take a big problem and you break it into smaller chunks. So like we've done with the Dean's party that you needed to have or making coffee. Like a simple thing, you break it down in sequential steps. And I am going to go into more detail on this one in the next slide. Next, perspective taking. This is simply the point of taking somebody else's viewpoint and trying to see a problem from their perspective. The reason this is good is if you follow straight traditional problem solving, your mind, your mind works in a specific way. The moment that you are forced to take a perspective of somebody else, to put yourself in their boots, to think from their viewpoint, and to justify the decisions that they are making, then it forces a completely different part of your mind to work and you can come up with a completely different answer so if you want more information on this i can provide you with an article that you can go and read in your own time next one is envisioning so if you are told to organize a staff year in party it's literally you take the problem and you unpack it and you imagine what it could look like so 
was dorf hier in Porti. I see a big bonfire on a beach. I see a crayfish. I see braai. I see a band playing guitar music, etc., etc. And you unpack the entire thing. It might be completely impractical. You might not have a budget over time or over resources, but it is easy for other people to see your picture and to see what you're thinking. So that you can get on the same page. And somebody else might say, well, I like the idea, but we can't take the entire department to the sea, so we have to do it in Joburg. But for the rest of it, it's cool. Now, it's also very important when you do your project planning that you, un that you identify the key project driver. So, so it could be that somebody says, I need these five things done, and it is not negotiable. You can't leave any of them out. Or if I say, it has to be done by the end of a week, or it has to be done in three weeks. It's not negotiable. Like if you work on a on a World Cup or a, um, a Olympic Games, that date is set in stone. It will not move. So if you are late, you are late. You have to deal with it. And it's very important when you speak to somebody. So it's similar if you work on your house and you want somebody to come and put in a new bathroom, they'll say it's going to cost you 25000 But if you give me 5000 more, then I can give you a, a shower that has a steam massage function. And if you ask that question and people say, okay, so what can you do for 35000 then you know budget is not where the problem is. It's by trying to figure out how much I can get for how much money. Now, to unpack the scope, there are different ways to do it. You can do a brainstorm, so that means you get, if your project is to build a computer system or to build a, a, a new training facility or whatever it is, you get everybody together and you make a mind map or you all come up with ideas and you decide how it could work. You can bring in an expert. And you can do a work breakdown structure. So, so what we've previously, previously done when we did our challenge is we have taken post-it notes and you say step one, it's not sticking, step one, step two, step three, step four, step five. And if you can break the problem into different sections, you do this in different colors. So if anybody can remember back to last week, when I gave you your problems, all of you had different color post-its. So if you bring all of the post-its together, then you can see the yellow is a project stream or a work stream. It's a specific section of a project. It's a sub-project. And the green is a specific sub-project and the purple is a specific sub-project, and you can quickly see what's cutting in the entire project. So a work breakdown structure is simply when you put the stuff in sequence. Now, what your challenges is, oh, firstly, like we've said, there's a problem with understanding. Everybody's not on the same page. There's a problem with perspective. People think they are on the same page, but they're not. There's a problem with group think. Everybody thinks the same and nobody's questioning, are we actually looking at the right side of the elephant? And another one is granularity. What this means is when you break it down into steps, is that you take the correct level of detail. So if we look at making coffee and you break it down into steps, you are going to switch on the kettle, you're going to pour water in the kettle, you are waiting for the water to boil, pour the water into the kettle, and you are not going to say stir, 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 because that's too, too much detail. 
And if you draw all this activity because making coffee in the biggest scheme of things is actually really easy. So you are just going to see very, very refreshments. You are not going down to the level of take a spoon out of a draw. But for in a bigger project, I'm just trying for you to understand where the level of detail is. This is not easy and it's going to come with practice. But if you do it enough, you will be able to put stuff in sufficiently small detail, but not too small and not too big, but that part of the problem gets lost. Next, what you're going to do is you're going to, like we did with our class challenge, you identify different work streams or sub projects, you break it down into sub projects. And if you can use different color postcards, and when you put the stuff in a logical sequence and you put it on a whiteboard. Now it's important to understand dependencies. What I told you, a dependency is you need to make the coffee before you can drink it. One thing has to happen before the next thing can happen. And dependencies get complicated. That's much more complicated than the example I told you now. So I'm going to jump into more about dependencies later. If we look at a specific little example, so what the problem is here is we are opening a new shop in a different part of Gauteng. So we have a business, but we want to open a different business. And we have broken this into sub -pro problems, sub projects. And now we have to organize this. So if you look at my example, so we need inventory so that we have things to sell. You're basically going to decide what to order and you're going to order it. And when you get it, you unpack it. But to unpack it, you need shelves. So you have to order the shelves and you have to install the shelves. And then you can unpack the stuff. You need to find a site. So you have to decide, are you going to be in Boxburg or Germiston or Four Ways or wherever? And if you decide on the location, then you can say, I want this shop or I want that shop. So find the site, buy a site, wait for property transfer, get the keys. You need a manager, you need to appoint staff. You can have a grand opening, but the grand opening is obviously only once everything is done. You need to register a legal entity. You must obtain a business permit. Like I said, you need to select where you are going to be. And once the party, once everything is, is done, you want to have our opening party. So there are steps for this. So you've taken this problem, you have broken it into little chunks, you yes. have used different colors of post it, and you put them on the board. And now what you have to do is put it in sequence. So you have to try and find a logical sequence. So you can see it might look a bit dear my car, but just wait, you'll see that the picture starts crystallizing. So you need to appoint a manager, and when you have a manager, the manager can appoint the staff. And once you have the staff, the staff can order the inventory and the staff can order the shelves. And with a little bit of effort, you've taken your complex problem, you have broken it down into sub projects, and you have put them in a logical sequence. Now, what we have to look at is how long does it take? So you have to go and look at each and every activity and so if this activity takes a week or it takes two weeks or it takes six weeks. And some things might don't take that much time. So it is a event, but it has a zero duration. If I give you the key, that is 30 seconds. It is a milestone, but it, it doesn't take time. So you are going to work your path in terms of what sequence of things happening.
like for example dependency to have a party you you have to have a things that are ready for the party otherwise you can't i mean you can have a party by yourself if you didn't invite anybody else so some things have to happen in sequence you cannot install the shelves before you get the keys before because you don't have access to the building you can buy the shelves before you install the shelves. That doesn't matter because you don't need the key for it. So for each and every activity, you in weeks or whatever, depending on what your project is, if it's a short project, you might not go into this much detail. But you are going to write in days, in weeks, in months, or whatever the time frame for your project is, you are going to write the times. So to take the selected time to decide if you are going to be in Boxburg or Vereniging or wherever, you need to do a bit of calculations and, and financial costs and see where is the best market for your project. So maybe that takes four months. And for you to register a new company, you can do it on a website. It's the same day. Job, job doesn't take time, so zero. And for you to get a business permit, let's give it maybe a week. To find the site, you have to look at various sites within Boxburg or within Vereniging now, once you've settled on the town, then to negotiate and to buy that site, there's lawyers involved. It could take long, maybe six weeks, and we have to wait for property transfer, and then we get the key. Three weeks to appoint a manager, four weeks to appoint staff, maybe it's longer, maybe shorter. But you try and work out how long it might take, and you go through your entire project. Now, the duration of a project is not the amount of time it takes for all of these things. If you had all of them, it will add up to 53 weeks. It is possible to do this in less than 53 weeks. So what you have to try and work out is something that's called the critical path. The critical path is the slowest period it would take to do the steps. So some steps are simply slower than other things. For example, if you look at the red arrows, critical path, and this is also something that takes judgment and it takes an exercise to work out if you have a whole bunch of events, what's going to take longest and what is dependent on what else that has to happen before or after. So what I've done in the red is I've indicated a critical path. If you are open this for discussion, it could be another project manager that comes up with a different project critical path. Doesn't mean that I'm right and he's wrong or vice versa. So you get the keys, you install the shelf, and you unpack the inventory and you can have your grand opening. So you understand the logic that some things has to happen and these things take specifically long. So that means that my project is not a, a 53 week or 55, whatever that I add it up to. You can do it in 33 weeks. Next step. When you do your time frames, you go and look at the average amount of time that you think it can take. So uh, for you to do a slide is maybe one hour. For you to do a set of 20 slides, is maybe two days. So you work on an average and you say for each activity, we should be able on average to do this activity in one month, six months, five days, whatever it is. And it's very important that when you plan, you try to be as accurate as possible. You can't go and say, I need two years for this if you know you can do it in two hours. And at the same time, you have to build in a little safety margin for yourself because sometimes things don't work out the way that you think that they're going to work out. Now, your project plan is based on the anticipated average time. So this means 
there's a 50% probability that you do it in shorter, or it could 50% probability that it could be longer. Now, if you look at each activity and use like this activity, takes X amount of time. It is possibly that things can go completely wrong. And if an activity should take you 10 weeks, it is possible that it could take you 16 weeks if things go completely wrong, or it could take 20 weeks. So you have your average, but you decided this is a reasonable amount of time. And when you do a worst case, and you say if everything cocks up, then maybe it's going to be X amount of time longer. Now, in terms of doing your calculation, you don't want to say we work it on the worst case scenario because it is it's potentially too worst case, too much of a worst case scenario. So, for you to be 90% safe, you work 50% between your two. So, if your average is 10 weeks and the worst case scenario is 18 weeks, then potentially 10 minus 18 or 18 minus 10 gives you 8 and 8 divided by 2 gives you 4. So you could potentially have this done in 14 weeks. Now, if we look at our time frame again, we have to build in a little bit of a contingency. So we have our critical path. This is what we think it should take on average, but it's 33 weeks. But if we do our exercise, so you can see the average this side, we do a worst case scenario. We think if everything goes wrong, there's lawyers and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, maybe this thing will run up to 57 weeks. But 57 weeks is completely unrealistic. So we are going to be 90% safe and peg it 50% in the middle. So this means that it's the difference between 57 and 33, and that means that we can do this project potentially in 45 weeks. And this is what we put on our project plan. This bit of the training gets fairly complicated, so it's honest, it is important that you get your head wrapped around this. The most important to understand is you are potentially too optimistic if you work on the average time. But you cannot be too pessimistic because then you will never get anything done, so you work halfway in between. Now, once you have your sequence and you put the stuff and you've got a little work breakdown structure and everything is in sequence, you need to see is it possible to speed the thing up. Now, this terminology is what the Americans call it, is project crashing, is when you try to see if you can squash, if you can compact the project. Here in South Africa, I don't think a lot of people say crashing, and if you say my project is crashing, I think your project is your project is going down. So maybe say that I'm trying to find a way to speed it up or to compact the project. There's different ways that you can do this. You can add more budget. So if you have more money, you can throw more resources, you can put more people, you can maybe work longer hours. You can reduce the scope. You can make it less work in the same amount of time. Or alternatively, you can overlap activities. So if we're looking at how overlapping, we add all the building, buy shelves, and buy stock. This is what our initial planning was, and we put it on the whiteboard. You don't have to wait for the one thing to finish before you can start with a one with a other. In some of the activities, it is going to be possible to overlap it so that you can shorten the entire period of time. So let's say this takes duration X, 
if you have overlap, before you are finished with one thing, you take a task that is not dependent on and not constrained by another task and you move it up. So we can start looking for shelves and buying shelves before we have the keys to the building. What the benefit of this is, is by the time that you get the keys, you might also have shelves and you can move in immediately. But if you first wait to get the key and then you order the shelves, then you have to wait a few more weeks to get the shelf. So buy the shelves and you can break it down in subsections. So you get the quote, you order, you install. And you don't have to wait for the shelves before you order the stock. You can order the stock so that they can sort it out so that by the time the shelves arrived, you can install the shelves and then the stock comes. So it gets complicated because you are trying to line up a whole bunch of things that has to happen and you must order the sequence so that the one thing doesn't become a problem for the other thing. It doesn't help that you buy the stock and you get the stock but you don't have the shelves and you don't have a key to the shop because you can't move in. So you need to work out what the influences whichever other part of a project. And if you squash it and you compact it, you can get a gain in terms of time. So you could have one a few weeks and made it shorter. What I think I'm going to do is I'm going to park it and we are going to call it today. There is a huge chunk of information which I downloaded into your brains. You can take some time, you can absorb it and you can go and sleep on it. We can maybe open up a question session if you want. And then in our next section, we are actually going to do uh, look at what do you put in your project plan? How do you actually manage the project once the project has started happening? And key suggestions of things that you have to keep in mind to make sure that your project succeeds. So to go back to a point that I made earlier, it frequently happens that you get called into a meeting and somebody will say, you have to do this, you have three weeks, six months, whatever period of time, go and do it. There wasn't sufficient thinking or it's possible that there was not, so don't, take, don't be insulted if there's any project managers who have randomly decided on a period of time. It is possible that you didn't understand the nature of the problem, you didn't understand how much effort it's going to take, you might not have understood how many people it's going to take, so if you get called into a project, then go and say, we need to plan. And then you actually break the thing down into little chunks, work out your sequence, work out how long it can take, and then your project can start. If you give somebody instruction and say, give me a new computer system or build a new factory or build a new spaceship, you've got three months, you are looking for trouble. Your project planning gets much better and the likelihood that you are going to successfully achieve what your project wanted to achieve increases exponentially if you unpack the thing properly and you plan it properly. So I've said my bit, Janis, are there any questions? Let's just open that to the group um, to see if there's any questions from the audience. Hi, my name is David. I, I just want to know how do you begin to qualify something to be a project? This, uh, David, you're jumping the ship a bit. This is, I'm trying to address this in one of the slides that are still coming. 
what some project management methodologies use. There's different methodologies. And some of them will say something is not a project if it is not three months or longer. For your purposes, three months is, is unrealistic because probably 99% of the things that you do is less than three months. So this is something where the department will have to create an internal standard to say, if I create a slide, one slide, it's not a project because it is something that we can do in two hours. If it is a slide for a internal meeting, however, if that slide is a slide where the dean of a faculty has to discuss something with a president of a country and the World Health Organization, then there are suddenly the whole picture changes. It is not just a slide. The risk, the complexity, and everything else changed, and then you will need to bring in standards. So whether or not something is a project, you will have to look at what is the risk involved, what's the complexity involved, how many role players are involved, what's the budget, what's the time, etc. And you'll have to get an internal standard within your business or within your faculty department where all of you are on the same page as to these are the standards that apply in this situation. And if it's a bigger project, you need to add these two free steps. And if it's a, a university-wide project, this and this and this. And if it's with Department of Health, of government, this and this and this comes in. And if it's with World Health Organization, this and this and this and this additional requirements come in. Thanks, Ben. Um, any other questions before we close? Just put your hand up if you want to ask a question. Okay, right. Um, thank you so much, Ben, for um, doing the second session of uh, project management. I found it very valuable, especially with the practical um, examples. Um, yeah, and we look forward to the uh, next session. Fine.